to television's unchallenged authority on the stars of show business and big business. Discover how life's winners live, love, and spend their fortunes. Enter their dazzling world of luxury on privileged tours of the fantasy palaces they call home. Hello, uh, my name is Stephen Albert. I am one of the founders of Studio Name and I thought it would be fun to share with you our uh, rather humble collection of artworks that we have accumulated over the last few years from artists that we've worked with and uh, shared studios with. There aren't many works and they're not very big but uh, it'll give you an idea as to this sort of thing we like and some of the amazing work of some of the great people that we've spent time with. So to be a little bit indulgent at the very beginning, uh, before uh, obviously I was lucky enough to be able to pay for anybody else's work, uh, obviously I made my own work. So the only piece of work I have in the house that is something that I made myself are these three uh, sort of interpretations of bullets that I have sculpted out of layered plyboard to give this kind of uh, rainbow or layered sandwiched effect. I suppose one of the reasons that I have kept these and keep them in the house is, yeah, I like them as objects, but the amount of time it took to carve these and finish these, it always felt a little bit uh, of a waste to throw them away or put them in a box somewhere or uh, just to forget about them. Uh, I always want to cry in my heart when I see sculptors uh, carving up pieces of wood or chipping it to make room in their studios and uh, you know it, it's another element of what we were taught at Leeds University which is most of what you produce will end up as landfill and this is a problem that artists always struggle with. But anyway, so I kept hold of these and they sit in the corner of the living room. And I think they mark an in interesting sort of uh, beginning to the journey that takes us to how we ended up in Leicester and how we end up collecting a few other bits of artwork made by other people. So these bullets essentially were the starting point of me working on a project that was about the renewal of war. I started making these at the beginning of the Iraq conflict or the invasion of Iraq and they then led on to uh, me taking a trip out to France to Verdun to collect metal to recast that metal in the form of new bullets. That then took me on to another phase where I wanted to reproduce uh, bullets to take on the same volume as a human being because I felt like at the moment we were invading Iraq we were also losing the very last generation of men who'd fought in the First World War in the trenches and for me there was a, there's a real correlation here between this memory disappearing in its primary source and us renewing those old mistakes. So I went out to Verdun somewhere I'd been before when I was 14 years old we were travelling through France and we happened upon a guy who approached us in a restaurant and he asked us if we could help him sort of pull his car out of the mud the following day. So we, we drove out into the fields, into the forests and on the way he gave us a potted history of the Battle of Verdun. French and Germans tried to bleed each other dry, it was the biggest uh, continuous and bloodiest battle of the First World War. And he showed us how, the, if you looked in the ploughed fields, there were chalk lines where the plough had just, just re-sort of uh, unsettled the ground. And he said, if you walk along anything where there's a bit of white chalk coming to the surface, you'll find debris. And we were a little bit kind of uh, doubtful as to this. It sounded like a bit of an exaggeration because we knew nothing of Verdun. We were just holiday makers passing through. But we stopped with his car, he opened the boot and, and somewhat alarmingly had a boot full of old uh, stick grenades and helmets and 
the butts of guns and all sorts of stuff he'd just collected walking around, which I might add is, is illegal in France, but there we go, some people collect them. So myself and my friend then jumped the wall while my father helped him dig his car out and we walked across the ploughed field and we picked up probably 30 spent and some unspent rounds of ammunition just in those 30 yards on a ploughed field. And we took them back and we took them home. They stayed in the bag for many years. So at this point, this seemed like the right place to revisit as society or the sort of Britain was about to revisit its old mistakes. This then grew into a bigger project. I took over an abandoned Waterloo church, rather ironically paid for and built to celebrate the Battle of Waterloo. It was in the centre of Leeds. It had been abandoned since the 1970s, so I went and had a nice chat with the vicar who was the key holder. He said, wonderful, take it on as a studio and do a great show. So I took it on. I spent about four or five months in there just filling it up with these slip cast plaster bullets that were measured to be the volume of human beings so that when you put them in the pews and in the church, they took on a kind of human form. I then did that for my degree show and combined it with a sort of local arts festival thing as well. And these, these bullets have stayed around because they've kept the mould ever since and they still make an appearance now and again uh, and even appeared at LCB Depot just before Christmas in another guise. But the important thing that started with these wooden bullets that I still have next to the fireplace is that the wooden bullets led to the casting of the metal, led to the slip casting in the church and at the end of that show, just as I was taking the work out, a bus full of elderly gentlemen turned up dressed in tweed uh, with rosy cheeks fresh from a rather splendid lunch and they started taking photographs and started giving me their business cards and it turned out that these men were the church commissioners and they were various retired men from different walks of life who now worked as trustees for the Church of England looking after their derelict properties around the UK and once a year they would be treated to a week out in the field where each day they would go and visit several properties in one diocese and in the middle of this they'd have a, a nice luncheon. So I was lucky enough to get them after this luncheon so they were all in high spirits and they were saying oh it was wonderful work more people need to do things like this in the buildings that we have empty here's our cards never hesitate to get in touch if you want anything which is always a mistake when you do this this is you know because people like me will hold you to this so uh, this is how we ended up or i ended up becoming sort of the founder of several studio groups and it uh, all began with the making of these three wooden bullets I finished my degree and was offered a place at the Florence Trust in London on a year-long residency. Again, in another, uh, rather sort of ironically, in another church. It's probably important to also mention that whilst at the Florence Trust that year, I met my future wife, business partner and joint founder of studio name, Yuka Namakawa. Uh, once I'd finished the residency there, I became disenfranchised with the London studio system. It was very competitive, overly priced. People didn't talk to each other, everybody was locked in their rooms and it was it was quite uh, alienating. I wanted to uh, remake the artist's studio that you find in art schools, very open and uh, friendly and the cross-pollination of ideas being central. So I took those business cards from those gentlemen and I kept on emailing them and their secretaries much to their annoyance and asking what spaces they might have in the London area. Now clearly they had very few spaces that were of any use in London because these things get developed and sold very quickly. So they kept telling me to go away, please go away, please go away. Every week, send emails, letters, make phone calls, they tell me to go away. And I did this for six months uh, and it was literally on the last week when I thought, okay, I'll give it one more week and then I'll have to try something else or just give up. And they came back to me and said, oh, actually, we have two spaces. And we ended up going with a space in Tottenham, which, again, was obviously another church building, this time a church hall. It had been derelict for a number of years, so we took one half over as studios, and they redesigned the other half, and we shared kitchen spaces and toilets at the back. We got a reduced rent compared to market rates because what we committed to do was provide 
outreach projects for local children, including children's workshops, dance scholarships, classes for the uh, Boys and Girls Brigade, skills sharing sessions, and we also ran an international residency. This is where I met the artist who made the following piece of work that we have on our bookshelf. This is a piece of work by a fantastic artist called Tessa Farmer. Tessa was one of the artists who took a space at what became known as Tottenham Hale International Studios, or this for short. And her work is made from uh, desiccated sort of insect remains, dried plant roots and other organic ephemera. Uh, she takes these sort of tiny sculptures to give us a glimpse into a world of uh, almost sort of like fairies. Kind of, if you can imagine, sort of storybook land of Tinkerbell. Tessa sort of envisions the veils of mischief and magic as a natural species. Tessa creates these tiny creatures, as you can see, this one's riding this uh, bee. And she gave this as a gift to Yuka and me for our wedding. And when I eventually stepped down from Tottenham Hale to concentrate on studio name, Tessa took over the running of that organisation and continues today as the director. Thank you, Tessa. So the next piece of work is by Tim Fowler and pleased to say, actually I'm going to be embarrassed to say that this was the very first piece of work, original artwork that I bought directly from an artist. Just to give you the background, Yuka and myself came to Leicester to start a new studio organisation called Studio Name. We didn't know anybody in Leicester and we didn't know any artists in Leicester. So we really didn't know whether this would work. We did some market research, we spoke to a few people and we thought that if we built something decent, then decent people would come. And very pleased to say that Tim Fowler was one of the very first people through the door and he came recommended by everybody that we spoke to. Tim's main concern within his work is exploring the colour field. Although vivid, Tim's works are invariably balanced and using a signature colour palette of extremely bright and intense hues makes his work distinctly recognisable. His explorations in tone and texture are mainly depicted through portraiture and architectural paintings and he uses a variety of medium within his work, combining oil, acrylic, spray, enamel and graffiti inks. Tim subverts traditional and contemporary methods of applying these mediums using brushes, different aperture caps and marker paint, mops, to orchestrate purposeful marks, strokes, strips, scrapes and smears across the canvas whilst constructing his exciting and dynamic work. That's the blurb, but the honest reason as to why I bought the work is that I simply like it. One of the most amazing things about having set up studio name in Leicester is how much it's influenced myself and Yuka in that people like Tim Fowler, uh, John Joe, Elliot, Loz Atkinson, uh, Tom Van Harowich and others have all come into the building with an energy that we rarely saw in London, where they want to get up and get out and sell their work, and they're not waiting for somebody to come and do that for them. So Tim represents himself around the world, in LA, in London, New York. Tim's also represented by a couple of galleries in both Newcastle and London, and we've been fortunate enough to show Tim's work, and I've also been very honoured to be able to collaborate even on a small level with Tim, on one public commission and some experimental sculptural works. Tim's very generous with his time. He'll always give somebody half an hour to sit and talk to him and he'll give them their opinion when required. So very quickly and somewhat now sort of unchronologically, uh, we're going to go to number four, which is A Skull by Tim Fowler. So Tim, being uh, the shrewd and clever artist that he is, uh, has or uses certain motifs, one of them being a very strong one of the skull. And this has developed over the years that I've been watching him from very basic images of skulls to elaborate, highly decorated ones to now large abstract pieces. And I'm really pleased to say that we've been lucky enough to buy one of the smaller skulls that was part of a series of 100 skulls that he did for LCB show, where he painted 100 skulls in the period of one week and sold every single one of them in the opening night. Uh, and we also then bought a very recent work by him and also possibly my favorite work that he's ever made, which was this uh, abstract skull. And we gave this as a gift to my sister and brother-in-law for all their kindness over the years in putting up with us at Christmas while we sat on the sofa drinking and eating and doing nothing. 
So this is a piece of work that uh, Yuka bought from Tom Van Harwich after he did a show at a small project space at Studio Name. Tom came to us from another studio in Leicester and was looking to really expand his practice and give it one last push or one last try after, I think, feeling frustrated for a number of years that he was stuck between academia, teaching art and not having enough time to make his own art. So he really invested himself and threw the dice by taking on a big studio with us that was more expensive than what he was used to. He did a solo show and you could really like this piece of work. I'm, I was kind of indifferent to it, I've got to be honest. You know, I enjoyed the aspects of it, the collecting. I think it is very clever, the idea of burning out elements of the animals depending on how much they have been erased from existence, how threatened they are. I think this is a really strong idea. Uh, aesthetically, the piece is very small. Uh, I'm always drawn to bigger pieces because <laughs> I'm a bloke. But what has happened is this has really grown on me over time, as has Tom's practice. And I think this is also because Tom's practice has grown pretty substantially since he's been at Studio Name. And I'm not going to take uh, responsibility for that because we've done nothing except give him a set of keys and a space. And Tom has literally done all the hard work. And it's amazing what he's done because he's gone through a series of different works and ideas, but it's all on the same theme, which is uh, man's destruction of uh, the natural world. And he's used everything from uh, cigarette cards to pages from encyclopedias. He's burned holes in the gallery walls. He's created burnt banknotes. And then he's developed this onto these most amazing uh, drawings some of them where he's got the audience to interact and do the destruction themselves and somewhere he's created the sort of the destruction or, or the erasure himself by rubbing out his previous work and this is all kind of really great art stuff because it's speaking not only about cave paintings and animism and how artists have this uh, lineage going back to cave painting of creating things that then become real and creating sort of symbols that around which we can cooperate and around which ideas are formed and he's subverting this and inverting this and showing the negative element of this kind of well showing the erasure he's the artist who is rubbing out both his own work and existence i mean if i had enough money i would buy some of these later larger pieces but i would also have to have enough money to have something bigger than a two-bed flat in North London. So for the time being, all we have is this one small work of cigarette cards by Tom Van Harowich. But the way that Tom's career is going, being the star artist or was planned to be the star artist this year at the other art fair in Toronto, in New York and London, he was also going on a residency in Japan with studio name and obviously all this has been put on hold but the thing with Tom's practice is you could put this on hold for a year this is timeless this is what artists are meant to do this is speaking of universal inescapable truths these are more prescient now than they have ever been what Tom is talking about and Tom's fears are here we're living it and so I think this work and Tom's practice is about to really explode and his time is now so if you have some money i would buy his work immediately number six this is a piece that i commissioned from the artist alison carpenter hughes and it's personal on a number of levels obviously because it's yuka it's a picture of her on the day that we had our wedding photographs taken not our wedding. You have to have official wedding photographs taken in Japan. It's, it's very important, way more than in the West. And as Yuka and I got married uh, quite discreetly uh, at the local council hall by ourselves before going for a KFC dinner. Yes, I know how to treat the ladies. We were obliged to do proper photographs for the sake of her grandmother for Obachama. And so I flew my sister and mother over as well and we had these photographs taken and Yuka's never looked more beautiful. 
So I commissioned this piece of work from Alison Carpenter Hughes. Now it's personal on a number of levels because Alison came to Studio Name on a local residency, and the local residency is named after Yuka's deceased father, Toru Namakawa. So this residency is very important to us, and Alison started the residency having not made work for around 10 years because life happens and we gave her a studio of three months a stipend and then a solo show at the end and Alison never stops surprising you what she created for that show and what came out of that is quite remarkable because within the space of the next 12 months following the solo show she became needlework person of the year UK she was commissioned on public commissions, private commissions. She then went on to do the international Toru Namakawa residency and went to Japan for two months. What Alison does is clearly unique and stunning. The work very much speaks for itself, so I'm not going to talk about it. What I am going to say is that if Alison ever realises just how good her work is, then she stands a real chance of a high level of success. And we commissioned this piece, or rather I commissioned this piece, as a birthday gift for Yuka. I, like a few others, exploited Alison's naivety to her own skills or capability or worth. Does that sound too harsh as an artist? And she was offering uh, individual commissions for £50 each. That's right, I said £50. So I completely jumped on this and got my commission in before she realised that she'd completely undersold herself. So we're working with Alison now. She's taking on a bigger studio and as things develop in Leicester and we open up a new premise, we hope, who knows what's going to happen anymore. We also have a, a much bigger space dedicated, ready for Alison, which we are going to underwrite half of the cost of for the first 12 months because we still see that Alison has a lot of room to grow and she needs that space to grow because the potential of her practice is huge. Works 7 and 8 uh, Ryoko by Eldo Yoshimitsu. So these were beautiful prints that uh, the artist gave to me and Yuka as thanks for uh, assisting in his negotiations at Titan Publishing when he was in London. Eldo used to teach Yuka many years ago and through social media they stayed in touch and then we connected and obviously Yuka being in London and bilingual helped him in the negotiation process that went on over a day or so. And we got to know Aldo and his partner Junko san, and they're just fantastic people. And Aldo is the most amazing and prolific artist. So his career is, is quite long, and he has done many amazing things in different fields, including, as you can see, public sculpture work and commissions on a grand scale, residencies all around the world, shows. I mean, it, it's a little bit too much to mention. So he's, he does things like photographic work, travels the world doing shows and documenting as he goes. He also makes and collaborates for the music on his uh, Ryoko series. Here are some images of uh, shows, recent shows and individual pieces of work. There's the man himself. Really, in the most recent work, apart from his residencies in France, is work around his uh, manga character. Ryoko. And it's from these uh, Ryoko manga books that the original uh, screen prints or the limited screen prints were produced that were then gifted to us by Eldo. As you can see from these images, the work is just stunning and everything is produced by hand. There are no digital aftertouches or additions. We've also been lucky enough upon visiting Japan for Aldo to show us around some of the locations. Here he is taking us through the temples and uh, having some fun with us by making us strike the poses in the books. We didn't realize what we were doing at the time. And he's since even put me in one of his uh, later editions, which I'm quite keen to get my hands on to see just how bad a character I am. Anyway, I think we let Ryoko do the talking.
Number 10. Castings from a Gallery Wall by Masaya Eguchi. Masaya was our first international Toru Namakawa residency artist and he came to us from, well, Japan via Spain. And he is part sculptor, part painter, but just generally a very talented artist. As you'd expect with Japanese artists or makers who've been practicing for a number of years and Masaya now is somewhere north of 40. His technical ability is by Western standards incredible and so the output or the levels of output and the standard of output is mind-blowing. He was with us for a month and he produced more work than some people produce in a year. This was in a strange town surrounded by people who didn't really speak the same language and living in conditions that were not that easy so he did everything that we wanted from an international residency artist which was come in shake things up a little bit show everybody in the studios what other cultures are about and how other cultures go about making art whilst at the same time having a cultural and sort of life-affirming experience for himself so he stayed with us in london we took him around a few places he went to galleries uh, we ate a lot of food uh, we drank a little bit and got to know him very well can't say more than that really he is a fantastic artist very well established, represented by a couple of galleries on the continent. He shows all over the world, he's collected, and his work is to a very, very high standard, probably the highest standard of any artist that I've worked in close proximity to. The subtlety of his work is very interesting. Like most Japanese people, they're not in your face. They keep themselves to themselves, and yet the intensity that they hold inside is beyond the comprehension of most sort of uh, gaijin such as myself. Masai is on the outside a very chilled and relaxed guy but clearly has dedicated himself to his art practice and this shows. These wall castings were just one of a series of works he made for the show at Studio Name and he made six of them and he didn't even announce it he just made them one afternoon as a bit of a kind of a, a momentary gesture and sometimes these are the objects that, that really work. Now, I'm not saying they're the strongest objects in the show because he produced so many great works, but I love them because they're a direct representation of the gallery, but also they are like a, a moment in time. And he was kind enough to give these to us, partly because he didn't want to carry them back to Spain in his luggage, obviously, you know, big piles of plaster, but <laughs> also because he thought we might like them, and we do, and we've kept them, and they are going up on the wall as soon as we move into our new office to remind us of the project space at Studio Name and how, you know, despite it being quite humble and rough and ready, good things can still happen. So thank you, Messiah. Thank you for being such an amazing artist and inspiration to everybody else at Studio Name. Whenever you make love to someone else, you will remember this night by Willow Stacy. We bought this doily that has been embroidered with something that was said to Willow or somebody Willow knows by a man, usually a man. And this is from a show that she did at the project space at Studio Name where she produced a series of these works on all kinds of domestic uh, objects such as dusters, doilies, handkerchiefs, etc. And then put them into the gallery context and frame them. And I think this work literally speaks for itself because it's text-based. It doesn't take much interpretation, but the beauty of it is its simplicity. And it's such a strong idea, represented and produced so well that uh, we had to buy one of her works. And this is the only piece of work that both Yuka and I went halves on. Apart from this, I don't know what to say about Willow. She's a bit of an enigma to us. She's very quiet. Uh, she's a very busy person outside of the studio. She's clearly a fantastic artist, otherwise we wouldn't have spent money buying her work or allowing her to do a show in the project space. But she very much keeps herself to herself and I hope in the future more and more people get to know Willow and get to see more of her work because it's some of the strongest I've seen. Number 12, A Pill by Derek Mainella. So this is where it gets a little bit interesting, well, at least for me anyway, because this is the very first piece of art I've bought by an artist that I've never met before. How I came about this is 
and this is why it gets interesting is we kind of come full circle here whilst also you know i'm doing a really grown up bit of art buying by buying from a gallery and not the artist this gallery is called Caster Projects and it's run by a guy called Andy Wicks who is ex-Florence Trust like myself and Yuka but he was there a few years after us. He then decided to set up a gallery. Uh, he's been running that in Deptford and this is Derek's work. This is all painting by the way. So I kind of fell in love with it for a number of reasons. One it's just really bold and you know intense for obvious reasons and also it was a great little piece of original work for a reasonable price i'm not going to say how much and without going too far into it obviously the uh, subject matter is something that's probably close to my heart in my younger days as maybe many of us share the same history so caster projects as you can see do lots of shows and uh, he's now pretty much full-time this is an amazing space this is the current show, which is got loads of echoes of stuff like uh, Matthew Bonney's Cremaster Cycles, which is, for me, the highest praise you can offer anything. And the nice thing about concluding this little sort of guide of the artwork that we've bought with this piece of work, which is the latest piece of work which you've bought, is the fact that if I hadn't decided to carve those three bullets, I wouldn't have done the show in the church I wouldn't have been offered the place at the Florence Trust. I wouldn't have met Yuka at the Florence Trust. And I wouldn't have started Tottenham House Studios. Yuka and I certainly could then never start Studio Name. We would never have met all of those fantastic people. There would never have been a Toronamakawa local residency or an international residency. And I would never have returned to the Florence Trust. And this is how I met Andy from Castor Projects, because Andy is one of the trustees of the Florence Trust now. And this is how life moves. Sometimes you just have to make something and see where it takes you.